Hello, and welcome to the Apache Spark with Python course. In this course overview lecture, we'll see what this course covers and what you will learn from this course. In the first section, we'll develop a conceptual understanding of what Apache Spark is. Then we'll learn how to install Spark on your local computer. No matter whether you are using Windows, Mac, or Linux, you will be able to follow along. And we'll try out our first Spark job on your laptop, which is to count the occurrences of different words in an article. In section two, we'll learn Spark's core abstraction, which is resilient distributed data set. We'll start by learning the basics about RDD. Then we'll look at different ways of creating Spark RDDs. Next, we'll demo several most popular Spark transformations, such as map and filter and flat maps. Then we'll look at the set operations which could help us to integrate several isolated data sources. Next, we're going to go through several important Spark RDD actions, such as reduce, collect, and count. After we have covered both Spark RDD transformations and actions, we're going to recap the difference between those two operations and deep dive into Spark's lazy evaluation mechanism. Before we finish this section, I will show you a critical Spark capacity to optimize performance, which is caching. In section three, we'll get to know Spark's master and slave architecture, develop our understanding of some of the most important components in Spark ecosystem, such as Spark Core, Spark SQL, and Spark Streaming. In section four, we'll start by introducing pair RDD which is one of the most useful building blocks in Spark applications to work with key value style data source. Then we'll look at different ways to create pair RDDs in Spark. We can either directly return pair RDDs from a list of key value data structure called tuple, or turn a regular RDD into a pair RDD. Next, we'll dive into several useful Spark operations available for pair RDD, such as reduce by key, group by key, and sort by key, etc. Then we will apply the knowledge we have learned so far to analyze some California real estate price data through Pair RD API. After that, we'll discuss an advanced Spark feature that lets users control the layout of Pair RDDs across nodes, partitioning. We're going to finish section four by learning different join operation types of Pair RDD. In section five, we'll introduce more advanced Spark programming features, which allow us to share information across different nodes on Apache Spark cluster by broadcast variables and accumulators. In section six, we'll be talking about a critical component of the Spark, Spark SQL, which is Spark's interface for working with structured and semi-structured data. To better understand Spark SQL, we must get to know two important concepts data frame and data set. Then we'll take a closer look at how can we analyze the same Stack Overflow survey data using Spark SQL instead of Spark RDDs. We'll compare the pros and cons of using Spark SQL versus Spark RDDs. We'll finish this section six by demoing several useful performance tuning techniques working with Spark SQL. In the last section, We'll see how to scale our Spark workflow by running our Spark application in Amazon EMR cluster through Spark Submit. Hello. In this lecture, we'll provide a high-level overview of what Apache Spark is. Apache Spark is a fast in-memory data processing engine which allows data workers to efficiently execute streaming, machine learning, or SQL workloads that require fast iterative access to data sets. Essentially, Spark is a computational engine which can schedule and distribute applications consisting of many computational tasks across many Spark worker machines. Speed is a very critical aspect in processing large data sets as it means the difference between exploring data interactively and waiting minutes or hours. One of the main advantages of Spark regarding speed is its ability to run computations in memory. 
Apache Spark has an advanced DAG execution engine that supports a cyclic data flow and in-memory computing. Spark enables applications in Hadoop clusters to run up to 100 times faster in memory and 10 times faster even when running on disk. On the generality side, Spark is designed to cover a broad range of workflows. At its core, Spark provides a general programming model that enables developers to write an application by composing arbitrary operators such as mappers, reducers, joins, group bytes, and filters. This composition makes it easy to express a wide array of computations, including iterative machine learning, streaming, complex queries, and batch processing, which previously can only be done through multiple distributed systems. By supporting these workflows in the same engine, Spark makes it easy to combine different process models seamlessly in the same application, which is often critical in data analysis pipelines. For example, we can write one Spark application that classifies data in real time through Spark Machine Learning Library when the data is ingested from streaming sources via Spark Streaming. In the same time, the data scientists can also query the resulting data in real time through Spark SQL. That's it for this lecture. I hope you Hello and welcome back. We're going to install Java 8 and Git on our local box so that we can fetch our source code of our Spark project from GitHub and run it locally on our laptop. We need to install a Java development kit because Spark is built on top of the Scala programming language, which runs on the Java virtual machine. Also, to run our programs, we will use the Python API for Spark, PySpark. PySpark is built on top of the Spark's Java API, so we need the Java development kit to be able to run our programs. First, let's check if Java is installed on your laptop. Here, just launch a command line terminal and type java-version. If you already have Java installed, this command would print out which version of Java is currently being used. If you don't have Java installed on your laptop, or if your Java version is older than 8, let's move on to install Java on your local box. If you already have the desired Java version installed, you can skip this installation step. Here we Google install Java SE. The first entry is the official website to download Oracle's Java development kit. For now, we have to install Java 8. Since Spark does not support Java 9 for the moment, just click on the link. On the Java SE Development Kit Downloads page, accept the license. Click on the corresponding installer that matches your platform. We'll go through the installation process for Linux and Windows. If you have a Mac, the process is similar to one on Windows. If you have a Windows machine, you can skip ahead now. Let's go through the process to install Java on Linux. I'm running a 64 bits Linux, so I should download this one. After the installation is finished, open a terminal so we can finish the process. First, let's be sure we don't have Java installed. Now we have to create a folder to unzip the file we've just downloaded. Usually softwares that don't come with the Linux distribution should be saved under the OPT folder. So let's create JDK folder under OPT. Now let's change to the directory where our Java development kit files was downloaded. In my case, it's the downloads folder. Now we use the tar command to unzip the file under the file we just created. Let's check if the file unzipped correctly. Here it is. Now we have to add that Java runtime environment 
to our environment variables. First, let's go under the JRU folder on our Java development kit. Let's copy the path to this directory so we can add to our environment variables. To add a new environment variable, we have to edit our .barshreseed file under the home folder. Type export java home equal and paste the path we just copied it. Also, let's add the binaries of the Java runtime environment to our path so we can use the Java commands from the command line. Type export path equal dollar sign path colon dollar sign java home slash bin. Save this file and source it to apply the changes. Now we have Java installed. As a side note, there are easier ways to install Java on Linux, but this depends on the package manager of your Linux distribution. This method that I just told you should work for any distribution. Linux users can skip ahead now to the git installation step. On Windows, let's be sure we don't have Java installed. Now let's go back to the download page. Since I'm running a 64 bits Windows, this should be the one for me. After downloading the installer, just click on it and follow the steps. Now, let's check if the installation was correct. Open a command prompt and type java-version. I have uploaded all the source code for this course to GitHub. To download the source code from GitHub, you need to have Git installed on your laptop. You can check if you have Git installed by opening a command line terminal and typing git dash dash version. If you have Git installed, this command would print out the Git version you have. If you don't have Git installed, let's go to the process of installation. Here we Google download Git. The first entry is the official Git website. Just click on it. Now choose your platform. If you have a Linux machine, the download page just shows you how to download the Git using the package manager for different Linux distributions. You can just follow the steps for the one you have. If you have a Windows or a Mac machine, you have to download the installer. After downloading the installer, click on it and follow the steps. Here, check the option to add git to your path. This will allow you to run git commands on the command line. For the rest, you can just keep the default options. Now, let's check if the installation was correct. Open a command prompt and type git dash dash version. Now that we have Git installed, let's download the source code. Just open a browser and type https github.com jlee tutorial python spark tutorial. Now we are at the GitHub repository for our spark code. Click the clone or download button which displays the git clone URL for you to download the repository. Then click the clipboard icon to copy the URL to your clipboard.
Go back to the terminal and type git clone and paste the URL. Hit enter to download the git repository. After the download is complete, we'll have the Spark tutorial directory under the current directory. That's it for this lecture, and I'll see you next time. Hello everyone, and welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to download and set up Apache Spark. Here we Google Apache Spark. The first entry is the official Apache Spark website. Click on it. Click on Download. Select the Spark release you wish to download and click on the link. Click on the mirror URL to start the download. Let's go through the process of setting up Spark for both Linux and Windows machines. On Mac, you can follow the same steps as on Linux. If you have a Windows machine, you can skip ahead now. On Linux, open up a terminal. First, let's create the folder where we are going to unzip Spark. Usually on Linux, software that don't come with a distribution should be stored under the OPT folder. So let's create Apache Spark folder under OPT. Now, let's use the tar command to unzip Spark under the folder we've just created. Now that we have Spark installed, let's add the environment variables to make it easier to use Spark. First, go to the folder where you unzip Spark and copy the path. Next, let's edit the .bash rc file under the home folder to add the environment variables. If you have a Mac machine, you should add the .bash profile file instead. Now, let's add the spark home variable. Just type export spark home equals and paste the path you've just copied. At last, let's update our path variable to also include the Spark binaries. Just type path equals dollar sign path colon and dollar sign Spark home slash bin. Save this file and source it to apply the changes. Now we can check if Spark is set up correctly by starting a PySpark session. Just type PySpark and hit enter. We get a Python interpreter with a Spark session available. Don't worry about the warnings for now. If you're a Linux or a Mac user, you can skip now. On Windows, let's unzip the files we've just downloaded. For that, I'm using 7-zip. You can unzip whatever folder you want. I created an Apache Spark folder under the local disk, and I will unzip it there. First, unzip the file to get the tar file. Now, unzip the tar file into the folder you want. Running Spark on Windows is not different from other operating systems, but Hadoop has a problem with Windows NTFS file system. To be able to run Spark, download windows.exe from this URL.
create a new folder named Hadoop under the local disk. Inside this, create another folder named bin and save it there. Let's add some environment variables to be able to run Spark. Right-click on top of the Windows logo and go to System. Now, click on Advanced System Settings. Then, click on Environment Variables. First, add Hadoop Home Variable. Click on New. Give your variable the name Hadoop Home. And the value should be the path to the Hadoop directory we've just created. Now, let's add the Spark Home variable. Click on New again. Give your variable the name Spark Home. The value should be the path to the directory where Spark is. Now, let's add the Hadoop binary and Spark binaries to the path variable. Click on the path variable and then on Edit. Click on New and add percentage Hadoop Home percentage slash bin. Click on New again and add percentage Spark Home percentage slash bin. Close the windows by clicking on OK. Before running Spark, we have to create a folder TMP under the local disk. Under TMP, create a new folder named Hive. Hadoop needs these folders to run correctly. Now, open the command prompt and type Winitals chmod777 and the path to the folder you've just created. This will set the appropriate permissions for Hadoop to use this folder. Now we can check if Spark is fed up correctly by starting a PySpark session. Just type PySpark and hit enter. We get a Python interpreter with a Spark session available. Don't worry about the warnings for now. Before we go, let's change the Spark log configuration. This will clean up the standard output for when we run our Spark programs. We will change the log level from info to error to make the standard output less noisy, making it easier to read the output of our Spark programs as Spark logged a lot of stuff at info level. Go to the folder where Spark is and go to the conf folder. Now make a copy of the log4j.properties.template and rename it to log4j.properties. Open this file and go to the line that says set everything to be locked to the console. Change the following line log for j dot root category where it says info change it to error. With this, only error messages will be locked to the standard output. That's it for this lecture. See you next time. Hello everyone and welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to run our first Spark job, which is called Word Count. What the job does is count the occurrences of each word in a real article. 
You can open the project we've downloaded from GitHub on the last lecture using any text editor or Python IDE you like. I'll be using Visual Studio Code, which is a lightweight, free and powerful code editor. But you're welcome to use your favorite one. In our project, there is a directory called in. All our input data sources are in this directory. The article we are going to analyze is in a file called word underscore count dot text. Let's open it up. This is a short article about the history of New York with less than 1000 words. We are going to load this file and count the number of each word using Spark. Next, let's open up the word count file under the RDD folder. This is our first Spark program we are going to run. Don't worry if you don't fully understand all the code here. This is just an exercise to get your hands dirty with Spark. Let me quickly walk you through this file. First, we create the Spark context, which we import from the PySpark API. This context is the entry point to Spark Core. Our Spark app is named WordCount. We are going to run our application on an embedded Spark instance on our local box, which could use up to three cores of our CPU. Then we set the log level to error. If you change the Spark log configurations file, this is not necessary. Then we load the word count file as an RDD. RDD is Resilient Distributed Dataset, and we are going to see more of what that is later. Next, we are going to split the article into separate words using white space as the delimiter. Finally, we calculate the occurrence of each word and print out the results. Now, let's run this Spark job. Open a command line terminal. We are going to use the Spark submit script that comes with Spark. Just type Spark submit the path to the script you wish to run and hit enter. Let's go through the output. As you see, most of the words only appeared once. The word state appeared five times. And some common words such as two appeared 17 times. Congratulations, you have just run your first Spark program. Again, don't worry if you don't fully understand all the source code of this program. We'll go through all of them in the later lectures. Hello everyone. In this section, we're going to talk about RDD, which is short for Resilient Distributed Dataset. The entire world of Spark is built around RDDs, which are Spark's core abstraction for working with data. RDD is the core object that we will be using when developing with Spark applications, and it is probably the most important concept that you want to understand and know how to use. So, let's dive in. RDD stands for Resilient Distributed Datasets. So, let's start by talking about what is a dataset. A dataset is basically a connection of data. It can be a list of strings, a list of integers, or even a number of rows in a relational database. RDDs can contain any types of objects, including user-defined classes. An RDD is simply a capsulation around a very large dataset. In Spark, all work is expressed as either creating new RDDs, transforming existing RDDs, or calling operations on RDDs to compute a result. Under the hood, Spark will automatically distribute the data contained in RDDs across your cluster and parallelize the operations you perform on them. Once RDDs are created, what can we do with them? RDDs offer two types of operations. 
transformations, and actions. Transformations basically apply some functions to the data in RDD to create a new RDD. One of the most common transformation is filter, which will return our new RDD with a subset of the data in the original RDD. For example, we can use filter to create a new RDD holding just the strings that contain the word Friday. Actions, on the other hand, compute a result based on an RDD. One of the most popular actions is first, which returns the first element in an RDD. To summarize, every Spark program will work as follows. Generate initial RDDs from external data. Apply transformations such as map and filter on RDDs. Launch actions such as count to fire off the computations of the result, which will be optimized and executed by Spark. In the later lectures of this section, we will go through each of these steps in detail. That's it for this lecture. I hope you have enjoyed it. Hello, and welcome back. In this lecture, we'll be talking about how to create RDDs. Spark provides two ways to create RDDs. Loading an external data set and parallelizing a collection in your driver program. The simplest way to create RDDs is to take an existing collection in your program and pass it over to Spark Context Parallelize method. In case you don't know what Spark Context is, the Spark Context object represents a connection to a computing cluster. We will talk about Spark Context in great details in later lectures. Once you have a Spark context, you can use it to build RDDs. Once you pass the collection over to Spark Context Parallelize method, all the elements in the collection will then be copied to form a distributed dataset that can be operated on in parallel. This approach is very handy when you are learning Spark or running some simple tests with Spark, since you can quickly create your RDDs with little effort and run some operations on them. However, this approach is not very practical in real-life scenarios because it requires the entire dataset must fit into the memory of the driver machine before you distribute them across your cluster. In a lot of cases, the scale of this dataset we're dealing with is terabyte, which definitely won't fit into the memory of a single machine. So, a common way to create RDDs in Spark is to load the dataset from external storage. So, where do the RDDs come from? The external storage can be local file system. In our previous work count example, we have already seen how to load a text file on our local disk as an RDD of strings using the Spark Context text file method. More realistically, the external storage is a distributed file system such as Amazon S3 or HDFS. And there are lots of other data sources which can be integrated with Spark and used to create RDDs including JDBC, Cassandra, and Elasticsearch, etc. We won't cover all of them in this course. If you're interested, take a look at the reference in the next lecture. Hello, and welcome back. As we've discussed in the previous lectures, RDD supports two types of operations, transformations and actions. In this lecture, we'll be talking about transformations. Transformations are operations on RDDs, which will return a new RDD. Keep in mind that transformations will return a new RDD instead of mutating the existing input RDD. The two most common transformations are filter and map. The filter transformation takes in a function and returns an RDD formed by selecting those elements which pass the filter function. The filter function can be used to remove some invalid rows to clean up the input RDD or just get a subset of the input RDD based on the filter function. 
the map transformation takes in a function and passes each element in the input RDD through the function, with the result of the function being the new value of each element in the resulting RDD. The map transformation is versatile that it can do a lot of things. For example, it can be used to make HTTP requests to each URL in our input RDD, or it can be used to calculate the square root of each number. It is worth noting that the return type of the map function is not necessarily the same as its input type. Take a look at the following example. We have an RDD string, and our map function was to parse the strings and return an integer, which is the length of the string. Our input RDD type would be a string RDD, and the resulting RDD would be an integer RDD. Now let's take a look at a real problem that we could solve using the Spark filter and map transformations. I'm back at our Spark tutorial project. The file we're going to analyze is some global airport data that lives in the airports.txt file under the in directory. This is a CSV format file. From left to right, each column presents the airport ID, name of the airport, main city served by the airport, country where the airport is located, IATA, FAA code, ICAO code, latitude, longitude, altitude, time zone, DST, time zone in Olson format. Open the airports in USA problem file under the RDD airports package. The task for us is to create a Spark program to read the airport data from the airports.txt file under the in directory. Find all the airports which are located in the United States and output the airport's name and the city's name to the airports in USA text file under the out directory. The sample output would like this. Let's see how we can solve this issue. Just open up the airports in USA solution file under the same package. First, we initialize the SparkConf object. SparkConf object specifies various Spark parameters for a Spark application. Here, we set the application name for our Spark application. This would show in the Spark Web UI. We will see Spark Web UI in a later lecture. Then, we set the master URL of the Spark cluster. In this example, we will be running Spark in local mode so we can specify local in the master parameter. Local tune means this Spark job will run two worker threads on two cores of the CPU on my local box. If we set it to local star, it will be running locally on all the available cores. If we set just local, it will run locally with only one thread. In this way, we have constructed our SparkConf object and set the application name and master URL. Then, we can create a Spark context object by passing the SparkConf object as a constructor parameter. As we have mentioned before, Spark context is the main entry point for Spark functionality. The Spark context represents the connection to a Spark cluster and can be used to create RDDs, accumulators, and broadcast variables on that cluster. Then, we call text file method on the Spark context object to load our input file as a string RDD. Each item in the string RDD represents a line in the input airport file. Next, we need to find out all the airports which are located in the United States. So here, we call the filter method on the string RDD. The filter method takes a function as an argument. The function takes a string as an argument which represents each element in the RDD. This function returns a bool to decide whether this element should appear in the resulting RDD or not. So here, we split each line using a comma delimiter. Let's take a look at how is this comma delimiter being declared. Go to the comments folder on our project and click on utils. As you see, this comma delimiter is a regular expression which matches commas, but not commas within a double quotation. We can see there are some cities which have commas in their names, but
but the commas are being quoted. We shouldn't use those commas as the delimiter. We should only use commas which are outside of quotations as the delimiter to split our input lines. Let's go back to our solution file. To be able to use our utils class, we have to import it to our file. Since the commas model is in our root directory, we have to add the root directory to our current path to be able to import the commas module. We do this here. After splitting the line, we take the fourth split, which is the country of the airport, and return the airports of which country equals the United States. Two things we need to be aware of. First, the split method returns a list of the split result. The index starts from zero, so the index of three means taking the fourth split. Secondly, if you look at the input file, all the countries are double quoted, so we need to add the double quotation to the United States as well. Next, let's map the filtered airport line to the airport name and city name pair as required. Since Python does not allow us to write multi-line lambda functions, we have to move the logic to split the lines to another function. So again, we split the string using commas. Then take the second column, which is the name of the airport, and the third column, which is the city of the airport, and join them together with a comma. Return the join string to the map function. Lastly, we output the resulting RDD to the airports in US8 file in the output directory. Just run this application. To run this application, just use the spark submit command that we saw in the previous lectures. Open a terminal and type spark submit and then path to our file. After the computation is completed, let's go check out the out folder. We have an airport in USA file. Since we have specified our Spark application to run on two worker threads, the result of each worker will output to a separate file. So we have two output files. We can look at those two files. They are the expected airport name and city name pair. Now we have solved our first Spark test using filter and map transformation. Next, it's time for you to do a practice. Let's open the airports by latitude problem file. We will still be analyzing the same input airport data. We want to find out all the airports whose latitudes are larger than 40. And output the airport name and latitude pair to a file. It's your turn. Try to implement your solution in this file. Take your time to work on this task as this is your first Spark practice. If you get stuck, Take a look at our airport in USA solution file to see how we use filter and map function. We'll take a look at the solution for this task in the next lecture. Hello and welcome back. As we've discussed in the previous lectures, RDD supports two types of operations, transformations and actions. In this lecture, we'll be talking about transformations. Transformations are operations on RDDs, which will return a new RDD. Keep in mind that transformations will return a new RDD instead of mutating the existing input RDD. The two most common transformations are filter and map. The filter transformation takes in a function and returns an RDD formed by selecting those elements which pass the filter function. The filter function can be used to remove some invalid rows to clean up the input RDD or just get a subset of the input RDD based on the filter function. The map transformation takes in a function and passes each element in the input RDD through the function, with the result of the function being the new value of each element in the resulting RDD. The map transformation is versatile that it can do a lot of things. For example, it can be used to make HTTP requests to each URL in our input RDD, or it can be used to calculate the square root of each number. 
It is worth noting that the return type of the map function is not necessarily the same as its input type. Take a look at the following example. We have an RDD string, and our map function was to parse the strings and return an integer, which is the length of the string. Our input RDD type would be a string RDD, and the resulting RDD would be an integer RDD. Now let's take a look at a real problem that we could solve using the Spark filter and map transformations. I'm back at our Spark tutorial project. The file we're going to analyze is some global airport data that lives in the airports.txt file under the in directory. This is a CSV format file. From left to right, each column presents the airport ID, name of the airport, main city served by the airport, country where the airport is located, IATA, FAA code, ICAO code, latitude, longitude, altitude, time zone, DST, time zone in Olson format. Open the airports in USA problem file under the RDD airports package. The task for us is to create a Spark program to read the airport data from the airports.txt file under the in directory. Find all the airports which are located in the United States and output the airport's name and the city's name to the airports in USA text file under the out directory. The sample output would like this. Let's see how we can solve this issue. Just open up the airports in USA solution file under the same package. First, we initialize the SparkConf object. SparkConf object specifies various Spark parameters for a Spark application. Here, we set the application name for our Spark application. This would show in the Spark Web UI. We will see Spark Web UI in a later lecture. Then, we set the master URL of the Spark cluster. In this example, we will be running Spark in local mode so we can specify local in the master parameter. Local tune means this Spark job will run two worker threads on two cores of the CPU on my local box. If we set it to local star, it will be running locally on all the available cores. If we set just local, it will run locally with only one thread. In this way, we have constructed our SparkConf object and set the application name and master URL. Then, we can create a Spark context object by passing the SparkConf object as a constructor parameter. As we have mentioned before, Spark context is the main entry point for Spark functionality. The Spark context represents the connection to a Spark cluster and can be used to create RDDs, accumulators, and broadcast variables on that cluster. Then, we call text file method on the Spark context object to load our input file as a string RDD. Each item in the string RDD represents a line in the input airport file. Next, we need to find out all the airports which are located in the United States. So here, we call the filter method on the string RDD. The filter method takes a function as an argument. The function takes a string as an argument which represents each element in the RDD. This function returns a bool to decide whether this element should appear in the resulting RDD or not. So here, we split each line using a comma delimiter. Let's take a look at how is this comma delimiter being declared. Go to the comments folder on our project and click on utils. As you see, this comma delimiter is a regular expression which matches commas, but not commas within a double quotation. We can see there are some cities which have commas in their names, but the commas are being quoted. We shouldn't use those commas as the delimiter. We should only use commas which are outside of quotations as the delimiter to split our input lines. Let's go back to our solution file. To be able to use our utils class, we have to import it to our file. 
since the comments module is in our root directory. We have to add the root directory to our current path to be able to import the comments module. We do this here. After splitting the line, we take the fourth split, which is the country of the airport, and return the airports of which country equals the United States. Two things we need to be aware of. First, the split method returns a list of the split result. The index starts from zero, so the index of three means taking the fourth split. Secondly, if you look at the input file, all the countries are double quoted, so we need to add the double quotation to the United States as well. Next, let's map the filtered airport line to the airport name and city name pair as required. Since Python does not allow us to write multi-line lambda functions, we have to move the logic to split the lines to another function. So again, we split the string using commas. Then take the second column, which is the name of the airport, and the third column, which is the city of the airport, and join them together with a comma. Return the join string to the map function. Lastly, we output the resulting RDD to the airports in US8 file in the output directory. Just run this application. To run this application, just use the Spark Submit command that we saw in the previous lectures. Open a terminal and type Spark Submit and then path to our file. After the computation is completed, let's go check out the out folder. We have an airport in USA file. Since we have specified our Spark application to run on two worker threads, the result of each worker will output to a separate file. So we have two output files. We can look at those two files. They are the expected airport name and city name pair. Now we have solved our first Spark test using filter and map transformation. Next, it's time for you to do a practice. Let's open the airports by latitude problem file. We will still be analyzing the same input airport data. We want to find out all the airports whose latitudes are larger than 40. And output the airport name and latitude pair to a file. It's your turn. Try to implement your solution in this file. Take your time to work on this task as this is your first Spark practice. If you get stuck, take a look at our airport in USA solution file to see how we use filter and map function. We'll take a look at the solution for this task in the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to talk about another popular transformation. It's called flat map. Sometimes, we want to produce multiple elements from each input element. This is where flat map comes in handy. As with map, the function provided to flat map is applied to each element on the input RTD. But on flat map, the results are flattened before being returned. A popular case of the flat map transformation is to split up an input string in two words as we have seen in our previous word count example. We have as an input RDD a list of lines in a text and want to get as a result that list of words in this text. If we use the map transformation, we get as a result an RDD where each element is a list of the words for each line. To get the desired result, we have to then flatten this RDD. Flatten can be seen as unpacking each element, in this case, each list of the RDD. The result would be an RDD with the elements in each list. On the other hand, if we use the flat map transformation, we get the desired result right away. You might want to ask, when should we use flat map over map? Map should be used if you have one-to-one -one relationship between the rows of the input data and the rows of the RDD you are creating. Flat map should be utilized if you have one-to-many relationship between the rows of the input data and the rows of the RDD you are creating. Let's revisit our first Spark program, which is the word count example. Open the word count example under the RDD package.
we will run our application locally on three worker threads. Then we load the input article file as a string RDD. Then call flatmap on the initial string RDD. As we explained before, this flatmap works applying a function that returns a sequence for each element in the list and flattening the results into the original list. We take each line as an argument, split the line using space, which will return us an array of words of that line. In this way, we get back a new string RDD. Each item in the new word RDD is a word in the original input file. Next, we call countByValue operation on the word RDD. The countByValue operation will return the count of each unique value in the input RDD as a map of value and count pairs. We'll talk more about countByValue operation later. Now, we get back a map of word and its count. Lastly, we print out all the key pair of this map. We can run this application. To run this application, just use the Spark Summit command that we saw in the previous lectures. Open a terminal and type Spark Summit and then path to our file. As you can see, the output is each word and the original file and its count. That's it for this lecture, and I'll see you next. Hello, and welcome back. In this lecture, we'll be talking about another type of Spark transformations, set operations. RDDs support many of the operations of mathematical sets. Some set operations are performed on a single RDD. The most popular ones are sample and distinct operations. The sample operation will create a random sample from an RDD. It is quite useful for testing purpose. Sometimes we want to take a little random sample of larger data sets to apply some transformations, and we want to do it on our laptop. This is when the sample operation comes in handy. The sample method takes three arguments. The first one is whether the sampling is done with replacement or not. Sampling with replacement is a way of doing sampling. It's more of a statistical term rather than a spark concept. I have reposted an article which explains what is sampling with replacement. If you're interested in learning more about it, take a look at the next lecture. The second one is the sample size as a fraction. Let's say we want to take one tenth of the original data set. We can just put 0.1 as the sample size. The third argument is the seed used for generating random numbers. Next, we'll talk about the distinct operation. The set property which is often missing from the RDDs is the uniqueness of elements, as our RDDs often have duplicates. The distinct transformation would just return the distinct rows from the input RDD. Keep in mind that the distinct operation is quite expensive because it requires shuffling all the data across partitions to ensure that we receive only one copy of each element. You should avoid using distinct operation if deduplication is not necessary for your Spark workflow. There are some set operations which are performed on two RDDs and produce a resulting RDD from those two RDDs. Some popular ones are union, intersection, subtract, and Cartesian products. It's important to note that all of these operations require that the RDDs being operated on are of the same type. Let's start by introducing the union operation. Union operation gives us back an RDD consisting of the data from both input RDDs. This is quite useful in a lot of use cases. For instance, we can use it to aggregate log files from multiple sources. It is worth mentioning that unlike the mathematical union operation, if there are any duplicates in the input RDDs, the resulting RDD of Spark's union operation will contain duplicates as well. The next operation we'll talk about is intersection, which returns the common elements which appear in both input RDDs. Intersection will also remove all duplicates, including the duplicates from single RDD before returning the results. 
Keep in mind that the intersection operation is quite expensive, since it requires shuffling all the data across partitions to identify common elements. The next one is subtract. The subtract function takes in another RDD as an argument and returns as an RDD that only contains element present in the first RDD and not the second RDD. This is useful if you want to remove some elements from an existing RDD. Similar to intersection and distinct operations, subtract operation requires a shuffling of all the data, which could be quite expensive for large data sets. The last operation we want to talk about is Cartesian. The Cartesian transformation returns all possible pairs of A and B, where A is in the source RDD and B is in the other RDD. The Cartesian product can be very handy if you want to compare the similarity between all possible pairs. For example, we can compute every user's rating in each movie. We could also take the Cartesian product of an RDD with itself which would be useful if we would like to analyze things like product similarity. Now, let's take a look at a real-life example. Here we have two tab separated proxy lux files from one of the NASA's Apache servers. The proxy lux file contains the host name, log name, time, the HTTP method, the URL, response code, and the number of bytes. We have two log files. One contains 10,000 log lines collected on July 1st, 1995. The other one contains 10,000 log files collected on August 1st, 1995. Let's open the Unilog problem file under the rdd.nasa Apache web logs package. The task is to create a new RDD which contains the log lines from both July 1st and August 1st and take a 0.1 sample of those log lines and save it to sample NASA logs file in the out directory. Make sure the header lines are removed from the resulting RDD. Let's see how we resolve this problem. Open the union log solution file under the same package. First, we create the SparkConf object. In this program, we specify LocalStar as the master URL, which basically means our Spark application will run all the available cores on our local CPU. Then, we create a Spark context project from the SparkConf we created. Next, we load those two input log files as two string RDDs. Then, we call the union method on the July 1st log RDD and supply the August 1st log RDD as an argument. This will give us back an aggregate RDD that contains items from both RDDs. Then, we filter out the header lines. We have extracted the filtering logic to a separate method called isNotHeader. We get back a clean log file RDD which doesn't contain the header lines. Then, let's take a sample of 0.1 on the RDD. Lastly, save the resulting RDD as a text file. Let's run this application. To run this application, just use the spark submit command that we saw in the previous lectures. Open a terminal and type spark submit and the path to our file. After the execution is done, we check out the output file from the out directory. As you see, we have four output files. It means our Spark application runs on four worker threads. Each output file contains a portion of the aggregated log files. Now, we're done with the Spark program which demos how we use the union operation to consolidate logs from different time. It's time for you to do a practice. Let's open the same host problem file. We'll still be working on those two log files. Your task is to create a Spark program to generate a new RDD which contains the hosts which are accessed on both July 1st and August 1st. So the resulting RDD will only contain the same hosts, not the full log lines. 
Now, give a try to implement the solution in this file. We'll discuss the example solution in the next lecture. Hello and welcome back. In this lecture, we'll be talking about another type of spark transformations, set operations. RDDs support many of the operations of mathematical sets. Some set operations are performed on a single RDD. The most popular ones are sample and distinct operations. The sample operation will create a random sample from an RDD. It is quite useful for testing purpose. Sometimes we want to take a little random sample of larger data sets to apply some transformations, and we want to do it on our laptop. This is when the sample operation comes in handy. The sample method takes three arguments. The first one is whether the sampling is done with replacement or not. Sampling with replacement is a way of doing sampling. It's more of a statistical term rather than a spark concept. I have posted an article which explains what is sampling with replacement. If you're interested in learning more about it, take a look at the next lecture. The second one is the sample size as a fraction. Let's say we want to take one tenth of the original data set. We can just put 0.1 as the sample size. The third argument is the seed used for generating random numbers. Next, we'll talk about the distinct operation. The set property, which is often missing from the RDDs, is the uniqueness of elements, as our RDDs often have duplicates. The distinct transformation would just return the distinct rows from the input RDD. Keep in mind that the distinct operation is quite expensive because it requires shuffling all the data across partitions to ensure that we receive only one copy of each element. You should avoid using distinct operation if deduplication is not necessary for your Spark workflow. There are some set operations which are performed on two RDDs and produce a resulting RDD from those two RDDs. Some popular ones are union, intersection, subtract, and Cartesian products. It's important to note that all of these operations require that the RDDs being operated on are of the same type. Let's start by introducing the union operation. Union operation gives us back an RDD consisting of the data from both input RDDs. This is quite useful in a lot of use cases. For instance, we can use it to aggregate log files from multiple sources. It is worth mentioning that unlike the mathematical union operation, if there are any duplicates in the input RDDs, the resulting RDD of Spark's union operation will contain duplicates as well. The next operation we'll talk about is intersection, which returns the common elements which appear in both input RDDs. Intersection will also remove all duplicates, including the duplicates from single RDD before returning the results. Keep in mind that the intersection operation is quite expensive since it requires shuffling all the data across partitions to identify common elements. The next one is subtract. The subtract function takes in another RDD as an argument and returns us an RDD that only contains element present in the first RDD and not the second RDD. This is useful if you want to remove some elements from an existing RDD. Similar to intersection and distinct operations, subtract operation requires a shuffling of all the data which could be quite expensive for large data sets. The last operation we want to talk about is Cartesian. The Cartesian transformation returns all possible pairs of A and B, where A is in the source RDD and B is in the other RDD. The Cartesian product can be very handy if you want to compare the similarity between all possible pairs. For example, we can compute every user's rating in each movie. We could also take the Cartesian product of an RDD with itself which would be useful if we would like to analyze things like product similarity. Now, let's take a look at a real-life example. Here we have two tab separated proxy lux files from one of the NASA's Apache servers. The proxy lux file contains the hostname, log name, time, the HTTP method, the URL, 
response code, and the number of bytes. We have two log files. One contains 10,000 log lines collected on July 1st, 1995. The other one contains 10,000 log files collected on August 1st, 1995. Let's open the Unilog problem file under the rdd.nasa Apache web logs package. The task is to create a new RDD which contains the log lines from both July 1st and August 1st. And take a 0.1 sample of those log lines and save it to sample NASA logs file in the out directory. Make sure the header lines are removed from the resulting RDD. Let's see how we resolve this problem. Open the union log solution file under the same package. First, we create the SparkConf object. In this program, we specify LocalStar as the master URL, which basically means our Spark application will run all the available cores on our local CPU. Then we create a Spark context project from the SparkConf we created. Next, we load those two input log files as two string RDDs. Then we call the union method on the July 1st log RDD and supply the August 1st log RDD as an argument. This will give us back an aggregate RDD that contains items from both RDDs. Then we filter out the header lines. We have extracted the filtering logic to a separate method called isNotHeader. We get back a clean log file RDD which doesn't contain the header lines. Then let's take a sample of 0.1 on the RDD. Lastly, save the resulting RDD as a text file. Let's run this application. To run this application, just use the spark submit command that we saw in the previous lectures. Open a terminal and type spark submit and the path to our file. After the execution is done, we check out the output file from the out directory. As you see, we have four output files. It means our Spark application runs on four worker threads. Each output file contains a portion of the aggregated log files. Now, we're done with the Spark program which demos how we use the union operation to consolidate logs from different time. It's time for you to do a practice. Let's open the same host problem file. We'll still be working on those two log files. Your task is to create a Spark program to generate a new RDD which contains the hosts which are accessed on both July 1st and August 1st. So the resulting RDD will only contain the same hosts, not the full log lines. Now, give a try to implement the solution in this file. We'll discuss the example solution in the next lecture. In this lecture, let's talk about actions that you can perform on RDDs. Actions are the second type of RDD operation. They are the operations which will return a final value to the driver program or persist data in an external storage system. Actions will force the evaluation of the transformations required for the RDD they were called on. Next, let me walk you through some of the most popular actions in Spark. Collect. Collect operation retrieves the entire RDD and returns it to the driver program in the form of a regular collection or value. Let's say you have string RDD when you call collect action on it. You would get a list of strings. The same applies for other RDD types as well. So after the resulting RDD is returned, we can manipulate the results such as iterate over the collection to print them out at the driver machine or persist them into disk. This is quite helpful if your Spark program has filtered RDDs down to a relatively small size and you want to deal with it locally. Just be aware that the entire data set must fit in memory on a single machine as it all needs to be copied to the driver when the collect action is called. 
so collect action shouldn't be used on large data sets. In a lot of cases, collect action can be called on RDDs because they are too large to be fit into the memory of the driver machine. Collect operation is widely used in unit tests to compare the value of our RDD with our expected result as long as the entire contents of the RDD can fit in memory. Let's take a look at a collection example under the rdd.collect package. Here we have a list of words in the driver program. Then we call parallelize method on the Spark context object to convert the list of words to a string RDD. Then we can call collect on the string RDD to convert the RDD back to a list of strings. Lastly, we print the contents of the list of strings. Let's run this application. To run this application, just use the spark submit command that we saw in the previous lectures. Open a terminal and type spark submit in the path to our file. Next operation, we want to talk about count and count by value actions. If you just want to count how many rows in an RDD, count operation is a quick way to do that. It would return the count of the elements. Count by value will look at unique values in the each row of your RDD and return a map of each unique value to its count. This is useful when your RDD contains duplicate rows and you want to count how many of each unique row value you have. We have already seen the usage of count by value in our previous word count example. It'll return us a map of each word and its count. Let's take a look at another count example under the rdd.count package. This time, we'll run this application first. To run this application, just use the spark submit command that we saw in the previous lectures. Open a terminal and type Spark submit and the path to our file. We have an import string RDD. If we call the count operation on the RDD, it'll give us the total count of items in the RDD. The duplicates would count as well. We have two Hadoops in the RDD. Both of them count. Next, we call count by value on the RDD. This will return us a map of each unique word and its count. As you see, we have two Hadoops. In other words, only appear once. Next, we talk about the take action. Take action takes an element from the RDD. This operation can be very useful if we would like to take a peek at the RDD for unit tests and quick debugging. You can just take, let's say, the first three rows of the RDD and print them out to the console. Take will return n elements from the RDD, and it'll try to reduce the number of partitions it accesses. So it is possible that the take operation could end up giving us back a biased collection and it doesn't necessarily return the elements in the order we might expect. Let's open the take example under the rdd.take package. Just run this application. To run this application, just use the spark submit command that we saw in the previous lectures. Open a terminal and type spark submit and the path to our file. As you see, we have the same string RDDs here. If we call take operation on the string RDD, it gives back three elements from the string RDD. The next action is save as text file. Save as text file can be used to write data out to a distributed storage system such as HDFS or Amazon S3 or even local file system. We have already seen the usage of save as text file in lots of our previous examples. 
The last action we want to talk about is reduce. Reduce is probably the most common action in our Spark program. The reduce action takes a function that operates on two elements of the type in the input RDD and returns a new element of the same type. Spark RDD reduce function reduces the elements of this RDD using the specified binary function. This function produces the same result when repetitively applied on the same set of RDD data and reduces to a single value. With reduce operation, we can easily sum up all the elements of an RDD, count the total number of elements, or perform some other types of aggregations. Let's take a look at the reduce example file under the rdd.reduce package. Here we have an integer RDD of 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. If we call reduce function on the RDD, the reduce function we pass in takes two arguments. What the function does is to return the product of those two arguments. This reduce operation will be applied to all the items in RDD and return a single value, which is the product of all the integers in the input RDD. Let's run the application. To run this application, just use the spark submit command that we saw in the previous lectures. Open a terminal and type spark submit and the path to our file. As you see, we got 120, which is the product of 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. It's time for you to do a practice. We open the sum of number problem file under the sum of numbers package. Your task is to create a Spark program to read the first 100 prime numbers from the prime nums text file and print the sum of those numbers to console. Let's open the prime nums text file under the in directory. As you see, each row of the input file contains two prime numbers separated by spaces. It's your turn to implement the solution. We will discuss the sample solution in the next lecture. Hello and welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to take a look at the sample solution for the sum of number problem. Let's open the sum of number solution file under the sum of number package. We first load the prime number file as a string RDD. Our original file is a tab separate file, so here we split the lines by tab. However, the split results might contain empty strings as well. So we need to filter out those empty strings. On Python, the empty string returns false. So here, if the number is an empty string, this expression would return false. Otherwise, it would return true. In this way, we get back a new string RDD with each item being the string representation of one of the first 100 numbers. Then, we do a map transformation to convert each number from string type to an integer. Finally, we can call the reduce action the integer RDD. The reduce function we pass in takes two arguments. What the function does is to return the sum of those two arguments. This reduce operation will be applied to all the items in RDD and return a single value, which is the sum of all the integers in the input RDD. Let's run this application. To run this application, just use the spark submit command that we saw in the previous lectures. Open a terminal and type spark summit and then path to our file. See? The sum of the first 100 prime numbers is 24133. That's it for this lecture. I hope you have enjoyed it. Hello and welcome back. In this lecture, we will talk about several important aspects about RDDs. First of all, RDDs are distributed. 
Each RDD is broken into multiple pieces called partitions, and these partitions are divided across the clusters. Let's say your spark cluster has eight nodes. An RDD can be split into eight partitions. The number of partitions is configurable, and the RDD spread across multiple nodes can be operated on in each node in parallel and independently. This partitioning process is done automatically by Spark, so you don't need to worry about all the details about how your data is partitioned across the cluster. Secondly, RDDs are immutable; they cannot be changed after they are created. You might want to ask why RDDs are designed to be immutable. Immutability rules out a significant set of potential problems due to updates from multiple threads at once. Lastly, RDDs are resilient. RDDs are a deterministic function of their input. This plus immutability also means the RDDs parts can be recreated at any time. In case of any node in the cluster goes down, Spark can recover the parts of the RDDs from the input and pick up from where it left off. Spark does the heavy lifting for you to make sure the RDDs are fault tolerant. In the previous lectures, we have seen RDD support two types of operations: transformations and actions. Transformations are operations on RDDs that return a new RDD, such as map and filter. Actions are operations that return a result to the driver program to write it to storage and kick off a computation, such as count and collect. Transformations and actions are different because of the way how Spark computes RDDs. Even though new RDDs can be defined any time, they are only computed by Spark in a lazy fashion, which is the first time they are used in an action. Let's take a look at the following example. We load a string RDD from a text file and then filter the lines that start with Friday. If Spark starts to load and store all the data in the file once it sees the loading statement, we will end up wasting a lot of storage space. Because we then immediately filter out many lines by applying the filter transformation. Instead, Spark would delay the computation. After it sees the whole chain of transformations, it would compute the data which is needed for the result. In our case, Spark only start calculating the result when we call it first. In fact, what happens under the hood is that Spark scans the file only until the first line starting with Friday is detected. It doesn't even need to go through the entire file. Transformations on RDDs are lazily evaluated, meaning that the Spark will not begin to execute until it sees an action. Rather than thinking of an RDD as containing specific data, it might be better to think of each RDD as consisting of instructions on how to compute the data that we build up through transformations. Spark uses lazy evaluation to reduce the number of passes it has to take over our data by grouping operations together. If you are ever confused whether a given function is a transformation or an action, you can look at its return type. Transformations return RDDs, whereas actions return some other data type. This is a quite useful tip for you to tell if an operation is a transformation or an action. Hello and welcome back. We're going to talk about one of the most critical Spark capacity, which is to save a data set in memory or disk across operations for performance optimization. Sometimes we would like to call actions on the same RDD multiple times. If we do this naively, RDDs and all of the dependencies are recomputed each time an action is called on the RDD. This can be very expensive. Especially for some iterative algorithms, which would call actions on the same data set many times. If you want to reuse an RDD in multiple actions, you can also ask Spark to persist by calling the persist method on the RDD. When you persist an RDD, the first time it is computed in an action, it will be kept in memory across the nodes. This allows future actions to be much faster, often by more than ten times. Caching is a critical tool for iterative algorithms and fast interactive use. 
Let's take a look at the persist example file under the rgd.persist package. Here we have an integer RDD. We persist the RDD using memory storage level. We'll talk more about the storage level later. Then we call reduce on this RDD. At this point, parallelized transformation will be executed to distribute the RDD from the driver program to all the worker threads and calls reduce on this partition. Since this RDD is persisted, so it'll be kept in memory across the worker threads. When we call count on this RDD again, Spark won't paralyze the transformation again. It'll go ahead to do the count action. Each persisted RDD can be stored using a different storage level, allowing you, for example, to persist the data set on disk or persist it in memory. These levels are set by passing a storage level object to persist method. The cache method is a shorthand for using the default storage level, which is memory only. For memory only storage level, RDD is stored as deserialized Java objects in the memory. If the RDD can't be fit into memory, some partitions won't be cached and will be recomputed on the fly each time they're needed. Memory only is the default level. There are some other types of storage level. Memory and disk. This will store RDD as deserialized Java objects in the memory. If the RDD can't be fit into memory, the partitions which can be fit into memory will be stored on disk and they will be read from disk when they are needed. Memory only sir, similar to memory only, but it'll store RDD as serialized Java objects in memory. This is more space efficient than deserialized objects, especially when using a fast serializer, but more CPU intensive to read. Memory and disk sir, similar to memory only sir, but it will save partitions that can't be fit into memory to disk instead of recomputing them on the fly each time they're needed. Disk only, it will store the RDD partitions only on disk. You might want to ask which storage level we should choose. Spark storage level are meant to provide different trade-offs between memory usage and CPU efficiency. There are some factors we need to consider before selecting the most suitable storage level. If the RDDs can fit comfortably with the default storage level, memory only is the ideal option. This is the most CPU efficient option, allowing operations on the RDDs to run as fast as possible. If not, try using memory only SIR to make the objects much more space efficient, but still reasonably fast to access. Don't save to disk unless the functions that computed your data sets are expensive or they filter a significant amount of the data. Otherwise, recomputing a partition may be as fast as reading it from disk. What would happen if you attempt to cache too much data to fit in memory? Spark will evict old partitions automatically using a least recently used cache policy. For the memory-only storage level, Spark will recompute these partitions the next time they are needed. For the memory and disk storage level, Spark will write these partitions to disk. In either case, your Spark job won't break even if you ask Spark to cache too much data. But caching unnecessary data can cause Spark to evict useful data and lead to longer recomputation time. You should call the unpersist method on an RDD when you want to remove them from the cache. That's it for this lecture. I hope you have enjoyed.